Okay, good to be with you again. This is week three, so you're probably well and truly sick of me by now. There is light at the end of the tunnel, only uh, only two more to go. And I hope that where you are is a little warmer than it is here in Melbourne. We're enjoying, a, or not really enjoying, we're hating a really cold, wet period, but thankful for the rain that we need nonetheless. So we've been considering David and his faithfulness and failure, specifically in regard to different relationships in his life. We've been thinking of David and Bathsheba and David and Saul's family. And we really come tonight to think about David and his own family and his children in particular. So we saw initially with uh, our study on David and Bathsheba from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, uh, what had happened. And this really was a pivotal turning point in David's life. And we'll be going back to this and thinking a little more of this later tonight. And we considered then a little bit about Saul's family and the relationship that David had with Saul, those 10 years that he spent being chased by Saul, the special brotherly love relationship that he had with Jonathan, and the lovely grace and mercy that he showed to Mephibosheth um, later in his life. So tonight, David and his children is, is what we want to think about. And, and really, I guess David's role is, is a father in particular. And, and to think about this again at the outset, we want to be clear that we are seeking to learn lessons from what David got right, as well as from what David got wrong. And we neither want to lift him up or to drag him down, but to seek to learn from what scripture would record to us about David. So just as, as way of background, there is a, a number of, of fathers that are around David uh, that are recorded for us in in the first Samuel in particular. And we go back first to Eli. And it says of Eli in first Samuel chapter three and verse 13, that, that he didn't restrain his sons. It speaks of his sons as making themselves vile. And the thought is, is that, that these boys, they held in contempt the things of God. And they took the things of God that were precious and important. They, they held them in like value. They didn't esteem them and they made light of them. And rather than being boys that would lift the nation up and encourage the nation, they would drag the nation down. And Eli's failure was that he didn't restrain his sons. As a father, he wasn't a restrainer. And the thought there is that he became, he became weak, he became dull, he became dim, and he was faint. So there is a weakness in the way in which Eli is recorded for us as a father. We come to look at Samuel, Samuel sets a wonderful example for his sons. But at the end of his life, the nation, we thought of this last week, the catalyst for the nation wanting a king was to say, Samuel, your sons don't walk in your ways. They're not following the same journey as you. They're not on the same pathway as you. And they're not marked by either your conversation. They don't speak like you. They don't, they don't value the things of God like you. And their conduct isn't like you. So their journey is different from yours. They're on a different path in conduct and in conversation. They are different both in word and deed. And that was the catalyst for the nation saying, so, so we just want to be like everybody else. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to be set apart. We don't want to be unique and special for God, but we want to be like everybody else. And the catalyst was just this failure of these boys to walk in the ways of their father. It's interesting when you look through the kings, you find that there is no correlation between a good father and a good son. So you'll sometimes see where a father sets a wonderful example and he has a son that is a bad son. The king that follows is a bad king. Conversely, you also have a bad king and his son is a good king because he is not looking necessarily to the example of his father, but he'll look further back and he'll see a grandfather or a great grandfather, or you'll go all the way back to David and you'll be able to see that there is an example that he can follow. But Samuel teaches us that it isn't necessarily the case that a good example that is set will be followed by our children. When we come to Saul, the first really time that we see Saul in relation to his father, he's the son of Kish and he is sent out. Kish has lost some livestock, some asses, and he sends Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 9. He sends Saul and a servant and he sends them to go and to recover what's been lost. And he trusts his son with this task and he sends him on this mission. 
and Saul and the servant go and, and they, they, they don't have success. They get to a stage where they've searched and they can't find their father's property. And Saul says to the servant, he says, look, it's time for us to be getting back because dad will stop. He will stop caring for the asses and he'll start to wonder where we are. And it gives us this impression of his father as being a father that cared more about his kids than about his possessions. And Saul says, you know, he's not going to be worried about the livestock. He's not going to be concerned about the things that are lost. He's going to be concerned about both his son and his servant. That so gives a little insight into the sort of father that Kish was. He was, a, he was a father that was more concerned about his son and his servant than about his substance. The same chapter 9 and verse 21 speaks about them being a humble family. You know, Saul says, you know, I'm not even from an important tribe. And he says, and, and even more than that, he said, my family is the least of all the families. So this is a, a humble family, a humble father that Saul, Saul has been raised by. But Saul doesn't follow that example because he becomes a harsh father and he becomes a father that speaks rashly. And in verse 14, he's uh, chapter 14, he, he makes a, a declaration that no one is to eat until the sun goes down on account of a battle that they're involved in and that Saul might be prospered. He says no one is to touch any food. And Jonathan misses the message. He doesn't hear it. Somehow what Saul has decreed doesn't get to Jonathan. And Jonathan just reaches out his stick and he, he just takes a piece of honey that's just dripping down. It's right there. He just takes it. And he nourishes himself for the battle. And it comes to be known what Jonathan has done. And, and Saul says to him, what have you done? He says, you know, I, I said, this is, this is going to be the end of your life, Jonathan. You, you will die, Jonathan, as I will, I will be sure that you die, Jonathan, because of what you've done. And this is a father speaking to his son. He says, because of the word that I have spoken, your life will be taken from you. And it's the people that plead for Jonathan's life to be spared. It's not the father seeking to spare the son. The father says to Jonathan, you'll die this day. And the people say, Saul, be reasonable. He just took a little bit to nourish himself and look at the victory that he has gained in your service. So don't, don't take his life. The people are the ones that are, that are having his life spared as opposed to the father. So he's a harsh father. When you come to chapter 18, he's a father that uses his daughter's affection. He has promised his daughter Meridab to David. But when the time comes for her to be married, he gives her to another, he breaks his promise to David. But word comes to him that his other daughter, Michelle of Michael, has, has a deep affection for David. She loves him. And Saul is pleased by this. And he says, you know, he said, I can use her. I can give my daughter to be married to a man that she might be a snare to him. You know, what sort of a father would be thinking of his daughter as a, using her marriage as a snare? Imagine it. Imagine the, the fathers of daughters that are here. Our desire is that our daughters would marry someone that is worthy of them in the Lord and that would, that would lead them and guide them and that they can serve together and that they can bring glory to God together. And that's the prayer that fathers have for their daughters and for their sons. But Saul's desire for his daughter is that she can be a snare to her husband. Look at the foundation of that marriage. The word snare is, is really that... He would be the noose, like they would use a snare to catch uh, an animal by its head, just to, to, to wrap this snare around the animal. And that's what he is speaking about. It's the ring that would be put through the nose of an animal, be able to drag it one way and the other, and it would be a trap. And that is what this father wants for his daughter. And finally, these fathers that would be surrounding David is, is Jesse. And First Samuel chapter 17, David's own father. So this is the chapter, the David and Goliath chapter. And why David is ever there on the battlefield is because Jesse is a father that cares and he's a father that provides. And he says to David, take these provisions. He sends parched corn and he sends loaves to his sons on the battlefield. So you see just in those few examples of fathers that are around David's time, you see great contrasts and lessons that we can learn from them. From Eli from a father who did not restrain his sons. You know, as fathers, her job isn't to give her children everything they want. Her job isn't to say yes to everything her children ask for and to say yes to every question they put to us. There are times when we are to restrain our children 
and not to be weak and dim and dull, but to be leading and to be having proper attention to our children. And we can learn from Eli's example. And we can learn from Samuel's example and to understand that despite an example being set, his sons didn't walk in his ways. And their journey was different from his journey. And they, they didn't value the things that he valued. And we can learn from Saul's father. He would be a caring father that would value his son more than his possessions. But Saul wouldn't go on to show that same care for his family. Well, the great pivot point in David's life was in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We've spoken of that with Bathsheba. And we noted that David's reign is 40 years and the, the, the sin with Bathsheba takes place at around the midpoint of David's reign. So he's reigned for 20 years. There's a sin with Bathsheba and there's 20 more years to go. And tonight we've come to think about really those last 20 years of his life. Now, someone split 2 Samuel up like this. They've said that the first 10 chapters, 1 to 10, is David's triumph. And if you read those chapters, and we, we mentioned this in week one, that if you read those chapters and you got to chapter 11, you would say, no, this isn't David. This isn't how David will behave. This isn't the giant killer. This isn't the one who defended his father's flock from the lion and the bear. No, this isn't the one. So those first 10 chapters and earlier in 1 Samuel are marked by triumph in David's life. Chapters 11 and 12 is David's transgression. And that's your turning point that, that his reign and his life pivots on. It pivoted on decisions. Remember what we spoke about, how it started with just David saw. David saw, David had a lingering look, David took, and it went step by step by step. And his life unravels and his life pivots on that one single action. Very sobering. The last part of Second Samuel from chapter 13 to 25 is a series of tragedies that will unfold in David's life and in particular in David's family. Now, it's important for us to, to see a distinction between the consequences that David would face eternally and the consequences that David would place, David would face in an earthly sense. To give you an illustration of that, when I was 19, I had not had my license for very long and I was driving a car that wasn't very fast, but it was fast for me. And I was driving to Phillip Island, which is one of our coastal towns in Victoria. And I was driving a lot faster than I ought to have been. I was, I was breaking the speed limit. I was, I was sinning. I was willfully going significantly more than the speed limit. Well, of course, you know what happens when you do that. Invariably, there's the blue and the red lights come flashing behind you. And I was pulled over by the policeman. He comes to the door of the car and he said, he said, do you have any idea how fast you were going? Well, I, I knew, but I didn't know if he knew. So I said, oh, no, you tell me. And he showed me the radar gun and I had been going very quickly. And he said to me, I should send you to court for this. And I said, oh, don't do that. And he said, sit there for a minute. And I sat in my car and I realized what was before me. I was going to get a big fine. I was going to lose my license and I had a job that needed a car. So I was probably going to lose my job as well. Consequences of what I had done. So as I'm waiting for him to come back to the car, I prayed and I, I asked for forgiveness for what I had done. And I said, to God, I'm, I'm sorry. I acknowledge what I've done is wrong. But then I added a little bit on to the end of that prayer, which was something like this. If there's any way that you could get me out of this, that would be great not quite sure what I expected God to do, whether the policeman was just to disappear into thin air or he was to come back and say to me, look, we're going to forget this whole thing. But with the illustration I'm, I'm getting to is that the consequences of my sin were taken away in terms of eternal consequences. I won't bear the punishment for that in a coming day. The Lord Jesus Christ died for my sin. But I would not be removed from the consequences of it. So despite the fact that I prayed and said, I'm sorry, the policeman came back and he gave me the ticket for $400 and there was no driving for four months and there was no work for four months. So the consequences were not taken away. That's a small illustration and a small thing, but that applies to lots of things in our life that sin will be forgiven, but the consequences are not necessarily removed. And that's what David experienced in his life. 
Let's read some verses. Go back to 2 Samuel 12. As you know, in 2 Samuel 12, verse 5 and 6, David pronounces judgment upon himself. In verse 5, when, when Nathan has, has spoken to David, and he's told him this story that we know, we've thought of already, when he says, you know, there's this, this rich man's got many, many flocks, but he kills the one little lamb that his neighbor has to spare his own wealth. He just kills this lamb that's like a daughter to his neighbor. And David's anger when he hears this is kindled against the man. And in verse 5, it says that he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. So David pronounces, not realizing it's on himself, but he pronounces, if you like, his own death sentence. Because he says, the person who's done this, Nathan then says to him, David, it's you that's done this. So David's pronounced this judgment upon himself, which is a, a death sentence. But he goes on and he continues it and he says, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and he had no pity. But David makes two parts to his declaration. And his own judgment upon himself is that there should be death and there should be a restoration fourfold. Now, God then comes in and gives his judgment from verse 10. And it says in verse 10 of this chapter, Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Notice a couple of things about this verse just in passing. Notice firstly that Bathsheba's name is not mentioned. She is referred to as the wife of Uriah, and she will ever be the wife of Uriah. And that is a point that is clearly made to David here, and it's reminding him she wasn't used to take David. She was someone's daughter. She was someone's, someone's wife. So she is the wife of Uriah the Hittite. But notice also that it doesn't say that you have despised Uriah. It says, because thou hast despised me. Now, David, we know, would understand that. He would understand that his sin was against God and against God alone. Others were brought into it. Others were affected by it. But the sin was against God, all oh, sin against God. And that's brought before him here. Because you have despised me and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So the sword won't depart from your house. There will be turmoil and there will be tragedy in your family from this point forward. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. It will be an eternal struggle. I will take thy wives before thine eyes and I will give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. Think what David's just done. Think of what he has done to somebody else's wife. And God says to him, this is, this is what's going to happen in your own house. Verse 12, for thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Thou be it because of this deed. Thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And so begins this second half of David's life. This pivotal turning point from triumph, a little interlude of transgression to tragedy. And it will be unfolded like a wave, one after the other. And it will affect David in particular. The consequences of this will affect David and it will affect his wives and it will affect his children. It will affect the nation. We'll think more about that, Lord willing, next week. So David's sin was confessed. David confessed his sin. Remember Psalm 51. David forsook his sin. We don't read of it happening again. It happens in his family. But this instance with Bathsheba is a one-off. David's not repeating it. So he has confessed his sin. He has forsaken his sin. It says, we read there, that God has put it away. It's been dealt with. It's been removed. And yet there were still consequences. So there would be no eternal condemnation for David for what he had done. Eternal condemnation was dealt with. The Lord had put away thy sin, but there would be earthly consequences. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 24, it says of the Lord Jesus Christ, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. There is a, a hymn that I'm sure you know, and, and it's, it, it, it has the thought of God will not demand payment for sin twice. 
once at the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and again at mine. It's been dealt with. So there is no eternal condemnation for what David did. The eternal condemnation was dealt with when the Lord Jesus Christ died upon the cross. But what he would deal with would be the earthly consequences. And it would, they would be significant consequences and they would rip his family to shreds. Now, as we think of what happened to him in these last 20 years of his life, I want us to remember that David's family is a family of flesh and blood, just like you and me. Yes, they were different. They lived in a different circumstances. They were, he was a king. And yes, there was, there was multiple wives. I understand there was differences. But within that family unit, there was love between father and children. There was love between brothers and sisters. There was love between husbands and wives. Even amidst the, the mixed up and how difficult their home was and how dysfunctional their home was, it was still a family unit. It was still a family unit that we can relate to because we, we form part of families. We understand, we know what it is to be husbands or wives, mothers, fathers, or children. So we can experience some of these things. So as we go through them, just think about them in that context, that they are a family, and this is what happens upon a family. So we read in 2 Samuel of the child that would die. And if you look at the passage, it, it says in, in verses 16 and 17 of 2 Samuel 12, that David is fasting and he's, he's lying upon the ground all night. And his servants come to him and they say, you know, won't you come and eat something? But he will have nothing to eat. And he won't respond to them. He won't, he won't enter into eating with them. And he is fasting and he is petitioning and praying God for the sake of this child. But he's been told the child will die, but he continues to fast and to pray. But notice what happens in verse 20. It says that David arose from the earth. He washed, he anointed himself, he changed his apparel, and he came into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. And despite what's happened, the attitude of David's heart is that he gets up off the ground, he goes into the house of the Lord, and he worships. A lovely attitude of David's heart. It gives us an insight into him, into this great heart of worship that David had. So the end result of the first death of his first son, the first son to die, would be that there would be a, a period of fasting. So David is brought to his knees. He is brought to lying on his face. You've only got to go one page over in your Bible and to the very first verse of chapter 13 to begin to read about the story of Amnon and Tamar. Uh, Tamar is Amnon's half-sister. She shares David as a father, but they have a different mother. So their relationship is, is step-siblings. They are, they are half-brother and half-sister. Uh, Tamar is a full sister to Absalom. So that's why you get the reading of it, that he has fallen in love with his brother's sister. That she is his half-sister. So there is that family relationship. And he falls lovesick with her, not lovesick in a good way, but lovesick in a lustful, passionate way, without any desire or regard for, uh, for Tamar. And Amnon schemes, and he brings things to pass, even involving others, multiple others, including the King David, get involved in his schemes, and it ends up that he forces Tamar to sleep with him. In, in effect, he rapes her. He, he takes and he lies with her by force, despite her pleas for him not to do it. And even after he's done, he's done that, he's raped his half-sister, he then tells her to get out. And it, it tells us in the passage that, that as much as he loved her before, his hatred for her now was even greater than his love. So despite the, the, the passionate love that he had for her previously, after what he's done to her, his passionate hatred is even greater. And he, he, he kicks her out and turns her away. And she says to him, you know, almost what you've done in, in, in disposing of me is worse than what you did to me in the act itself. So this is in David's house. He's lost the son, lost the child that was born to Bathsheba. And he is now facing this in his own house where there is a rape between a brother and his half-sister. Now The word comes to Absalom and, and he, is, he is outraged, but he holds his peace for a period of time. 
gives him time to plot his revenge and to bring it to pass. And he does that in, in verses 28 and 29. Is that Amnon is killed on the orders of Absalom. So a brother is rising against brother. He is ordering that a brother is killed. His own half-brother is killed. So David in chapter 12 is fasting and he's lying on his face. In chapter 13, he is weeping over the death of his son Amnon. But then you come to the end of that chapter and he is mourning because of the absence of Absalom. So Absalom, after what he has done, he, he goes away and he leaves the king and he'll be away from the king in exile for a period of time. So in this chapter, David's lost a son through death and he's lost a son through treachery and through deceit. So just in these two little passages of scripture, you've seen death and you've seen incest and rape within a family. Do you notice that the, the way that it came home to David was, was through immorality? The way that David had treated Bathsheba, the way that he had seen and taken was what wasn't his to take, is what was now happening in his own family. Amnon was behaving in the same way as his father had. He was following in his father's immoral footsteps rather than, than following the good example of him. But when you come to 2 Samuel chapter 18, you'll read of the death of the third son. And there's a lovely uh, a lovely phrase in 2 Samuel 18, verse 5. We'll read that verse for, for the sake of this phrase. The king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, deal gently for my sake with the young man. Lovely, isn't it, that David would speak this lovely phrase and how often we've sometimes prayed for someone and we've used these same words and said to the Lord, you know, deal gently, pleading on behalf of another that the Lord would exercise grace and mercy. That's what David is doing. We'll think in a little bit about what Absalom's been doing all this time. But David's response as a father is to say, deal gently with the lad for my sake. On, on my account, treat him kindly and gently. And he doesn't get given that respect. And Absalom's life is taken whilst he is hanging from a tree. He would be shot with arrows and cut down from the tree. The end result of this is that David is weeping in the end of this chapter in verse number 33. So he's on his face, fasting and praying. He's weeping, he's mourning. He's weeping again in these, these chapters through the complete destruction of his family. The fourth son that would die, David's, David's uh, sentence that he pronounced upon himself, he would restore fourfold. His fourth son would be Adonijah. And his life would be taken in First Kings just after David died. David's, David dies in Second in First Kings chapter two and verse ten. David slept with his fathers. It tells us there, and then it goes on to speak in in the latter part of that chapter of Solomon giving instruction that Adonijah's life would be taken. So again, another son would take the life of his brother. It would be difficult, wouldn't it, to think of a of a more dysfunctional family than the one that we have just gone through. You know, sometimes when a person's before the courts, they'll, they'll be saying that this person's family is dysfunctional and they'll go into details of, of what a person's experienced. And you understand and you say to some degree that a person's character and behavior has been shaped by, by what they've experienced within their family. Well, think about the dysfunction in this family. In this family that is so much a part of scripture, and to whom so much of scripture is devoted. And not only would four sons die, but there would be a complete family collapse. In 2 Samuel, from chapters 13 to 18, there's the absence first, and there's the exile, and then there's the rebellion and the uprising of Absalom when he rises against his father. And he seeks to take, and in some part, and at some time succeeds, in taking the throne of his father and and getting the heart of the people to be with him. And it's a bit of a seesaw. The people's hearts and minds is sometimes with David and sometimes with Absalom. But you've got this roughly seven-year period. And the height of it is in chapter 16, when he's seeking counsel. How can he how can he make it so clear to the nation that he is king? How can he exercise power and make a statement? 
And he is given this advice that he would take his father's concubines, take what was his father's, and take those concubines and take them unto himself and to be immoral with them. And to do so in a way, it says that all Israel shall hear of it. And it says that it will be in the sight of all Israel. Remember what David did with Bathsheba was secret. But when Nathan spoke to him and he gave the pronouncement of what God said, God said, what you've done, you did secretly. But what I will do, I will bring it to pass in public before all of the people and before the son. It will be it will be known of all. And that's what happens when Absalom takes his father's concubines and he makes this statement that all Israel knows about and all Israel sees. And he has this great act of defiance against his father. He does to his father exactly what David did to Uriah. Do you notice this repeating? Not only did Amnon bring uh, immorality into the house, but Absalom does exactly the same thing. And the family just crumbles and collapses under the weight of what David had done. The consequences just caused the family to crumble. So four sons die. There is a complete collapse of the family unit and there is public shame. Others are affected by it and others are brought into it. And the thing that David did, it caused displeasure and it caused others to be able to blaspheme the name of God. And others were affected by what David did. There was a public shame in it. Well, this is, this is just a bit of a family tree of David and you know this well, but the part that I really want us to notice is just to, again, reinforce how completely his family was torn apart. Amnon raped Tamar, killed by Absalom. Absalom kills Amnon, rebels against his father David. Tamar raped by her brother. Adonijah is killed by Solomon as he was a rival to succeed and to follow after David as king. You look at that and you think, what sort of a family is that? And what sort of a failure of leadership in a home is that to have those circumstances? And then you notice this, that in Matthew chapter one, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a son of David. He's a son of David. Now we know he's a son of God, but he's come from the line of David. And you think how amazing that it would ever be recorded that he would be the son of David. Why not the son of Josiah? Because when he was eight, he would tear down the, the groves and the places where, where the, the evil was worshipped. Why not, him? Why not Noah? Why isn't he the son of Noah? Because Noah was righteous and he was perfect in his generations. And, and everybody else was wicked. God saw only wickedness, but he was pleased with Noah. Well, I don't know that David wrote Psalm 130. Some say he did. They say it's one of his penitential psalms following with the incident with Bathsheba. Others say Ezra wrote it. Whoever wrote it, they sum up beautifully the thoughts that David had. For the, with the Lord, there is mercy. And with him, there is plenteous redemption. Doesn't it encourage you and thrill your heart that this family, with all of its dysfunction and all of its issues and its complete breakdown, is a family that God would then use and be able to say, Jesus Christ, the son of David. But with the Lord, there is mercy and with him is plenteous redemption. How, how did he respond? How, how do you recover from this? You know, we can't leave it like that. So how did he respond from all these things that happened? How do you respond from your own sons taking each other's lives and, for the being the incest in the home. How do you respond from, from your son? It's almost like you've gone back to those 10 years of soul chasing him. He's got seven years of, of fleeing and of rebelling and re rebellion and insurrection with, with Absalom. How do you deal with that? Well, come to Psalm 3. And we'll read Psalm 3 and we'll refer to some verses from 4, 5, and 6. And these Psalms are thought to have been written by David when he's fleeing from Absalom. You know, the great thing about David is not only can we read about him and his family in Samuel King's Chronicles, but we can also 
read about how David felt in the Psalms. And when we marry those two things up, we get not just the historical account of what David did, where he was, what he what, what happened, but we also in the Psalms get to have an understanding of what was going on in David's head. Not just where he walked and, and how his hands moved, but it's how his brain was ticking and how he was feeling and the way that he was responding to it. So as we read Psalm 3, think about the mess of a family for an extended period of time and think about the loss and the dysfunction in that home. Psalm chapter 3, Lord, how will they increase that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. At some points, the whole nation was against him. Verse 3, but thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. Imagine being able to lay your head down and sleep amidst all this turmoil. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. In Psalm 4 and verse 1, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Verse 3. But know that the Lord hath set himself, has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. Verse 7. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. Despite this function in his home, he says, I am finding gladness and I am finding joy. In verse 8 again, he says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for, let, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety he had no reason to lie down and sleep and to feel safe and yet he did um five and verse seven but as for me i will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy and in thy fear will i worship toward thy holy temple lead me o lord in thy righteousness because of mine enemies make thy way straight before my face verse 12 for thou lord wilt bless the righteous with favor Wilt thou compass him as with a shield? Psalm 6 and verse 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Verse 4, Return, O Lord. Deliver my soul, O save me, for thy mercy's sake. And finally, in verse 9, The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. So that's how he deals with it. He deals with it by bringing it to the Lord and by going to the Lord. And in doing so, he finds comfort in circumstances that are anything but comfortable. And he finds peace in circumstances that are anything but peaceful. Despite being hounded, not just by King Saul for those 10 years, but now facing rebellion, insurrection from his own house for seven years, he is able to commit his way unto the Lord and to trust in God and even at the most difficult of circumstances he's able to worship lots of lessons from David that we can learn from David as father in a lot of ways it's it's a uh, it's difficult to categorize a lot of it as anything other than than failure for some of the ways in which he behaved and some of the things that he did but these things are written for our learning and we see that in all these things david he would have that heart for god and we'll continue lord willing next week and we'll look at david and in particular his relationship with his nation before we finally finish uh, the week after if the lord will when we'll 
consider that beautiful relationship between David and, and his God. Let's just close in prayer. Father, again, we give thanks for the lessons that you have left for us in Scripture. And we you know, just would acknowledge the importance of families and the importance of fathers. And we see the example of David, uh, a, a father and a family that was in turmoil, where there would be weeping and mourning and death and separation. And there would be the most difficult things that anybody would ever be called to endure. And yet, a father, there would be those times when David could draw aside and he could just consider your salvation and he would be able to rest and to sleep in peace. And father, we give thanks for the great assurance that we have that you will never leave us or forsake us. And that even in amongst the most difficult of circumstances and the most difficult of family relationships at times, that you are a God to whom we can turn. And the Father, we are also so thankful that there is mercy with the Lord and that you are plenteous in redemption and that even from a family such as this, it would be able to come that one who would be David's greater son, that one who would be not to be compared to Solomon, that would be a greater than Solomon that would be here. And Father, we give thanks for ever it was in thy plan and in thy purpose that our Lord Jesus Christ would come into this scene and would be called the son of David. Father, we give thanks again. We just pray that you would bless every individual, every family, and every home. Be with us, lead us, guide us, and bless us, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.